And we did hear a lot of criticism. I kind of, you know, sometimes felt bad for my dad because <laughs> um, people thought he was crazy. They thought he had lost it and that what was he doing? And uh, but, you know, we stuck to our guns and it's a beautiful theater. People were so happy when we restored it. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Total Michigan, where we interview ordinary Michiganders doing some pretty extraordinary things. I'm your host, Cliff Duvenois. So I was sent a bio for today's guest, and because she's literally conquered the world, I'm just going to kind of hit the highlights of it. So today's guest uh, has been an integral part of Detroit's business and philanthropic community for over 40 years. Dedicated business leader, devoted community servant, a supporter of many charitable causes, including an advocate for women and children causes. She has also been the president of, of Illich Holdings, which is the home to Little Caesars Enterprise. Yes, that Little Caesars. The Detroit Wed Wings, the Detroit Tigers, Olympia Entertainment, Olympia Development. Uh, her and her family uh, have been involved intricately in building the side-by-side -side project, which would be Comerica Park and Ford Field, home to the Detroit Tigers and the Detroit Lions. She was voted the best philanthropist in the Our Detroit Magazine, Best of Detroit 2022. She's got more titles than a car lot. Marketing Innovator of the Year, Best and Brightest Marketer, Top Business Woman, Most Influential Woman. She's a regular panelist on the weekly Michigan Manor Show, and that's a CBS 62. She also has a podcast, and I'm going to have to ask her how she fits time in to do that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show the owner of Illich Family Companies and the president of Illich Enterprises, and that would be Denise Illich. Denise, I, how are you? I'm good. Thank you so much. And you're welcome, and I appreciate you not falling asleep. While I was no, to make my way no, your bio thank you there. for the lovely bio, and it's great to be here. Yes, and uh, it's quite extensive. So we got a kind of a lot of a ground to cover. And what I would like to do is I would, I know your family history is very integrated into your history and what you're doing for Detroit. So if you would kind of just take us back to the beginning. And if I remember correctly, it was actually your father was an immigrant to this country. My grandfather. Your grandfather. Okay. Yes. Yes. Where did he immigrate from? So he immigrated from Yugoslavia. At the time, it was called Yugoslavia. Now it's Macedonia, or that's what we call it. Um, both my grandparents and uh, both sets of grandparents came from Yugoslavia um, and were immigrants and then landed here in Detroit. And um, we lived in, they lived in Dearborn uh, Heights, and my other set of grandparents lived in Detroit. So when I was young, I lived in a flat at the top of my grandfather's home. So they lived on the bottom, and then we lived upstairs for a while until we moved and got our own home. Now, how many people were in your little flat? It, it was my brother and I, my brother Ron and I, and okay. my mom and dad. And my mom always tells this funny story that when my grandfather wanted rent, he took a broomstick and pounded it on the ceiling, which was <laughs> the floor for her. And she knew then that he was expecting rent. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. And you, you mentioned this before in a talk that I heard you give, and I thought this was so powerful, but you said that you were about 10 years old yes. when your dad asked you probably one of the most pivotal questions you've ever been asked in your life. And what was that question? Well, we always sat around the kitchen table. There were four of us, I think, at the time. And uh, we lived in Dearborn Heights, and he said, I came home from school, and that's where we hung out after, and he said, what did you do to contribute to the world today? And I sat, and I thought about it a minute, and I said... pretty big question. Right, and I said, nothing, which felt terrible. <laughs> and I said, but Dad, I'm only 10. But I often say that that was when I realized that, you know... Um, you were to contribute to the world, he placed a high value on that and that it gave me confidence that he thought I could contribute to the world and it, it made me feel worthy. Uh, and so it had a huge impact on how I conducted myself from there on in. And a part of that is, uh, again, kind of going through your family journey here, at some point your dad had this idea to start a pizzeria. Yes. Where did that come from? Well, it was very interesting. He played ball for the Tigers. He played in the, um, you know, in the system. 
And they traveled, the farm system, uh, they traveled all around the country. And he just had this thing where he'd go and visit Italian places. He loves Italian food. And he'd always search out pizza places. And so he started to get an interest in it. And then he ended up getting a, a job. He asked a woman who owned a bar. It was called Haig's Bar in Detroit. Okay. And she let him sell food out of her bar. And that's where he kind of perfected the pizza. He sold food, but he also sold pizza. And he, he says he literally had a cigar box with money in it. <laughs> and that was where he started to really believe in the product. He did really, really well. And so he ended up taking part of that money and investing it in the first Little Caesar store, which was at Garden City. And it was in Garden City at Cherry Hill and Vinoy. It's still there today. It's been renovated about five times. And that's really where they would take me while they were bu building that store and working in that store. How old were you at this time? I was four. Oh, wow. Okay. And so I sat in the back room on flower bags, <laughs> and my mom took the money and ran the register, and my dad made the pizzas. And so, again, you know, by watching all of this, it set an example about a work ethic. And then, of course, the store was very successful. Most people told him. He took $25,000 and uh, put it towards his store, and many people told him that pizza was a fad and that he was going to fail. <laughs> and of course, you know, we've all learned it's not a fad. And then um, that was like, I think, in 1959. And then in 1962 uh, was the first franchise that we sold. And so then the company just started to grow from there. So let me ask you this question here, because I could completely understand going into the restaurant business. Where did the idea of franchising come from? It's a really great question. Um, Dad told me that he, you know, my dad never went to college and neither did my mom. And so he was a really good listener and he asked a lot of questions. He was on a plane and he was seated next to an oil man from Texas. And they started talking about business and this oil man put, planted a seed in his head about royalties. He had talked to him about how oil works, how you earn a lot of money off royalties. Oh, I and love where this is going. I know, right? <laughs> and so he started you know, that's what franchising is, is it's royalties. You pay a franchise fee and you pay royalties in order to use, you know, the brand name and to get the brand secrets and to build, uh, you know, whatever that franchise is. And so that's really what planted the seed for him. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so you're growing up, you're watching basically. So let's, let's take a step back here because I want to add this as part of your story. Where did the name Little Caesars come from? Well, that is uh, that came from my mom. So they were talking, and if you knew my dad, you'd really appreciate the story. But he, um, it was early in the in their career, and they were going to call um, the restaurant Pizza Treat. And uh, she said to him, "She goes, you know, you're like a um, a Caesar." And he goes, "Like, because that's like king, you know." Right. And he's like uh, Caesar, and she's like, "Yeah, you know." He goes, yeah, that's a good name. And she goes, yeah, but you haven't accomplished anything yet, so I think it should be Little Caesar. <laughs> and so it ended up being Little Caesar's Pizza Treat. And that's how we got the name. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. And so now the business is starting to take off. Yes. Your family is selling franchises. So one of the things I was actually thinking about on the way down here, because I've talked to a lot of people that are like second and third generation yes. you know, restaurant owners, whatever it is. Right. How many pizzas do you think you've made in your life? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I never, I never made, I never uh, counted. That's so funny. I haven't, I've never, I don't think I've ever been asked that question, <laughs> but I have no idea, but just many, quite a few, yeah. you know, and also how much pizza have I eaten? Because when I yes. worked at the company, my dad was always in the research, the R and D kitchen, and he was always testing new pizzas, new combinations, new toppings, and he would be constantly calling us saying, "Come taste this, come taste that. What do you think of this? What do you think of that?" So you know, we've we're really involved in pizza. <laughs> no, and that's actually really good, and that could be like a whole other topic right there because I love the innovation piece. Yes, because people can get so burned out on eating the same thing all the time. I mean, there's there's some comfort. And the fact that, you know, you can call Little Caesars and you know exactly what you get. Yes. But there's also, too, something where you sit there and say, you know what, I'd like to try something else. What else do you got on the menu that sounds good? Right. And Dad always talked about cravings, and he always wanted mm -hmm. to capture, 
you know, that craving that you have for things. Yes. And, and so, and, and like you said, he was always, he was very innovative and always wanted to try new things. Very open-minded about that. So you get to a point where you've graduated high school and you decided to go off to college. Yes. So where did you go and what did you study? I went to the University of Michigan. Okay. And I majored in political science and minored in English. And then I went on to law school, and I went to the University of Detroit School of Law. Now, was it your intent to get a degree and come back to the family business, or were you thinking you were going to do your own thing? I was thinking I was going to do my own thing. I, um, I worked for a federal judge. I worked for an antitrust law firm in Detroit. But then as I got more experienced, I, I said to myself, I want to go work for my family and help my family, you know, uh, because I was working for other people and kind of helping them economically. And I thought, why am I doing this? I think I should help my family economically. And right. so that's what I decided to do. I called my dad and I said, Dad, I'd, I'd like to come work for the family business. So I started out uh, as a lawyer and I was responsible for real estate leases and trademarks. And that was at the 50 store mark. We had 50 stores at the time. Wow. And when I left the company, it was uh, 4,000, 3, 4,000. Moses. Right? All over the world. Oh, that's just incredible. Yeah. Now, to take a step back here, what was it about law that made you want to study it in school? I think it was um, about being self-sufficient. I think that self-sufficiency um, breeds confidence. And I wanted yes. that education on my own. I knew I could pick it up and put it down. It's been invaluable for business. Um, it's taught me so many skills besides just the law. And so I, I wanted to know the law and I wanted to be independent. And I thought that the law gave me that. When So you said that, that it was right around the 50 store mark where you came back to join the family business yes. and now we're at 4,000 yes. plus all over the world. Yes. <laughs> Soon to be on Mars. Tell us, at what point in time did you ever sit there and say to yourself, holy cow, this is going to be big? I think it was when um, we decided to go on national advertising. I was responsible for all of the marketing uh, uh, at, at the time, and we were getting big enough to nationally market our brand. And that's when I realized, wow, we are a national company. We're we are not. Yeah, we're in the big leagues. Our competitors were Pizza Hut and Domino's, and they had very big budgets for national advertising. We were kind of an up-and-comer. Right. And, uh, and But we grew very methodically. We, you know, we decided we wanted to grow down the I-75 corridor, and uh, Florida was always the most popular state that people wanted to franchise. But then as we got bigger, uh, we started to go to the West Coast and the East Coast, and, and it was very exciting. I learned so much. Um, with that experience. I bet. And when you talk about that you were in charge of marketing, was marketing always kind of just in your wheelhouse? Did you have to take special classes for that? How did it work? Well, it was so funny because I worked in the legal department and the marketing department would come over and ask me to approve trademarks. And so I'd look at the ad and I started to give ideas about how to sell the pizza. And I remember I was like, what do you think about a 25 cent slice to try to create more traffic when really I was supposed to only be evaluating the trademark? Right. And the marketing people are always very open minded. So they're like, wow, we like that idea. Let's try that. And they did. And the sales went up. And I was so excited about that because it was an immediate yes. reaction mm -hmm. instead of, you know, a trademark or a, a lease that you negotiated that you might not see the benefit of it for five years. And so um, after doing that, I said to my dad, I'd like to move over to marketing. <laughs> and it was really a natural instinct and gift. I had n absolutely no training in marketing. And my father was brilliant in marketing. And he and I worked very close together um, in marketing uh, in order to grow the business. We were very in Sepatico, uh with my fresh ideas and his fresh ideas and his wisdom about the business. We were able to put a lot of really good programs together. So that was how I you know, landed in marketing. And I could also imagine, too, that just because you grew up in the business, you've seen so many customers yes. and heard so many comments about the pizza mm -hmm. and everything else like mm -hmm. that, that that probably really played a big factor in your ability to effectively market, because if we're if we're talking four thousand 
franchises, right? right. right? This is right. people that have given you their hard-earned money. Right. Not only that, but they have to have the customers that are like, yes, we want Little Caesars. Right, right. And, and you know, I asked my dad. He was so good at it. I said, well, how are you so good? I asked him the same thing you're asking me. How are you so good at marketing when you didn't go to college? And he said I he used to sell pots and pans door to door. Oh, that must have been tough. I know, right? And he said, though, that when he was in there, uh, you know, a potential customer's home, he learned about how they made decisions, who made the decision, what what factors went into the decisions on buying something, what right. they valued. And so that's how he ended up doing it. That is incredible. For our audience, we're going to take a quick break and thank our sponsors. When we come back, uh, we're going to talk about uh, just how far the Ilyich family <laughs> expanded their empire. Right. We'll see you after the break. Hey, if you are enjoying these great interviews, just take a moment and go to TotalMichigan.com slash join, and you can get these episodes sent directly to your inbox, because there's a lot more great stories coming. See you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Total Michigan, where we interview ordinary Michiganders doing some pretty extraordinary things. I'm your host, Cliff Duvenois. So, Denise, you and I were talking during the break, and we actually have a small little correction to make. So, why don't you tell us? Yes, I just want to make sure that we're clear. I've been referring to numbers kind of loosely, just counting franchise stores. So when you take our company stores and our franchise stores in total, we have 5,400 Little Caesar stores across the world. Which is still mucho. And sp- <laughs> yes, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of pizza, right? A lot yeah, of Little Caesar stores. A lot of pizza. Yes. And so a couple more questions here, because the, the one of the things that – really fascinating to me, and there's so many different directions to go with your with your story, with your family story, is first off, one of the things that really impressed me was the fact that when everybody gave up on Detroit, your family didn't. I mean, people were packing, leaving bags, leaving town, Detroit's done, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna rot away. And you know, you and your family are like, nope, and you actually like doubled down on Detroit. So I guess my bigger question would be is what is it about Detroit that your your family just invested so much into it? Well, um, I don't know if you saw that Cranes article, but or it was a cartoon. And when we moved down there in 1987, did you see it? When yes, all, it was a cute, everybody cute was cartoon. leaving and this big truck was coming into Detroit. I think it's really um, the fact that this is our home. My parents were born and raised in Michigan in Detroit, Michigan. They have so many memories um, of Michigan. And then, of course, raising us, they place such a high value on Detroit. It's been our home. And so it was very natural um, to want to be able to go downtown. And what really triggered it was the Fox Theater. So we had office, uh, we had made an announcement in Farmington Hills that we were going to build uh, a world headquarters on 38 acres. We, I still even have like the... Um, the, I think it was like a little trophy thing or whatever uh, with dirt in it right. or whatever that we still had <laughs> on the groundbreaking. But we decided we wanted to renovate the Fox Theater. And part of it was a business decision. There was a new arena in Auburn Hills, and we were competing for concerts. And we knew that there was a 5,000-seat venue in Detroit uh, besides or in addition to Joe Lewis Arena at the time. And so... Um, There was the idea to, you know, be able to book events at the Fox Theater. So we were intrigued. And, you know, I'll never forget going through with my family and particularly my dad when we walked through the Fox Theater. And it was, you know, very old, really blown out. Right. Very just abandoned. And uh, it was at that time that my parents, you know, got us all together and said, look, we, you know, how do you feel about building our world headquarters in Detroit? and changing direction because it's going to impact all of you. And so everyone resoundedly agreed to it, thought it was a wonderful idea, and that's, that's what we decided to do. And we did hear a lot of criticism. I kind of, you know, sometimes felt bad for my dad because <laughs> um, people thought he was crazy. They thought he had lost it and that what was he doing? And uh, But, you know, we stuck to our guns, and it's a beautiful theater. People were so happy when we restored it, many Detroiters have just amazing memories, whether they were their first date or they were proposed to. Everyone's got a story around the theater. Yes. So that's really what what uh, motivated it. And at some point in time, 
like some people go out and buy a car, <laughs> your family decided, hey, let's go out and buy a major sports team. <laughs> yeah, right. Holy cow. So which one did you buy first? Uh, the Detroit Red Wings. Now, why? Well, that, you know, if you know my dad, you would understand, you know, he would buy a team over a car, but he just loves sports. Always wanted to be a sports owner. I think it was a dream of his as time went on. We had sponsored tons of hockey teams. All my brothers played hockey. My sister was a goalie. And so uh, there was a real love of the sport by both he and my mom. And so the Red Wings became available and they were doing very poorly for many years. And this so was about when? This was 1982. Okay. When, he, when we actually bought the team. And so we ended up buying the team. And I remember saying to him at the time, the New York Islanders were like a dynasty. Right. And I had said to him, why did you buy such a bad team? Why couldn't we have bought like a good team, like the Islanders? Because <laughs> it was starting to dawn on me that this was going to be very hard. Right. Uh, and, you know, fans were really disappointed about the performance of the team. And it was going to take a lot of work in order to turn the team around and time. Uh, and he said, because it take, it, it um, builds character, Denise, this is going to build character. And I'm like, okay, I feel like I have enough character, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so off we went and, you know, as a family, rebuilt the team. The, the one thing I got to say is during your presentation you gave, you showed, a, you showed this photograph of your father and he's wearing the Red Wings jersey and he's holding the Stanley Cup. Yes. And this is like in the 1990s when yes, the that's Red right. Wings were on fire. That's exactly right. And I thought to myself, you know what, that photograph right there just encapsulates the family story. I mean, literally starting from nothing to the yes. point where you're owning a major team. Yes. It is my absolute favorite picture of my dad. He was always a happy person, but you know, he didn't smile often. And there was such joy on his face. And I teased him after I, I'd say, you know, you had seven kids. I don't see any pictures in the albums that you're smiling like you are about that Stanley Cup. I would tease him about it. But yeah, it's a lovely picture. It's why it's in my presentation. And then at some point in time, if one team wasn't enough, you went after a second team. Yeah, well, then what happened was dad, um, you know, his his love and passion growing up was baseball. I had mentioned that he played in the farm system and just loved the sport and really understood the sport. And the team became available in 1992. And so he made the decision to buy the uh, baseball team, the Detroit Tigers, which was so exciting for him. And we were all so happy for dad because that was his passion. And during this time when we're go you're going out and your 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 family is buying the teams, your business is growing, is there any point in time where you ever said to yourself, "Sweet Moses, how are we going to do all of this?" <laughs> yeah, right. It seems so overwhelming when you tell the story, but it all happened kind of in a very natural way and gradually over many many, you know, over decades. And so it just seemed as though one opportunity, you know, became available after another. Um, but it it was, you know, it was big business. When you own a sports team, it's a completely different business oh, I bet. than another business. You know, it's got unique uh, characteristics to it. And you're very much in the public eye. And, you know, I always tease that there's lots of general managers out there. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I like that. Detroit fans are invested in Indeed. The, in the teams, that they care about the teams. They know the players, and they're very invested. And sometimes you read observations that fans make, and you're like, wow, are they in the boardroom? Like, <laughs> they get it. And yes. they analyze things, you know, right on. And I think that's kind of cool. And during this time that you, you've bought, in, you know, your family owns now that, you know, the Red Wings, you've moved on to the Tigers – and again, if that wasn't enough, it's let's build Comerica Park. Let's get involved with Ford Field. So talk to us. What was, you know, what was that like? What was that whole process go? Did the city come to you? Was it a group of people that just came together and said, hey, this is what the city needs? How did that work? Well, we were um, playing baseball in the old Tiger Stadium. Mm -hmm. And it was very old, but very traditional. Uh, and, you know, we're in the food business. We're in the entertainment business. And we really wanted to offer the best amenities to our fans. And, I, you know, we did build, like, an addition, a little food court 
at Tiger Stadium in order to accommodate some of that. But at the end of the day, you know, everyone around the country were building new baseball stadiums. And so my dad had said to me, you know, I want you to go travel and visit every new baseball stadium across the country uh, in order to see what people are doing and see the amenities. And so really he wanted to build a new stadium. And then, of course, uh, what it just came together so naturally. It was going to happen behind the Fox Theater. But then there was the idea the Lions uh, wanted to do the same thing. And so we decided to, you know, property became available across from. Literally. <laughs> our world headquarters. It used to be a law school and Stro uh, business, uh, did business there. But they agreed to sell that land. And we ended up taking that land and building side-by-side -side stadiums, which were the first in the country at the time in an urban area to build side-by-side -side stadiums. And it's been a tremendous success. Oh, it has been. Yeah. And personally, since I'm a Tigers fan, yeah. I love Comerica Park. Yeah, it's a I, great I, park. I, oh, I, I, I love there. And the whole, actually the whole area down there yes. just completely renovated and all the new business coming in, new restaurants right. coming in. It's so vibrant, right? Yes. And it's fun. And at night it's fun with all the lights and the action. It's just terrific. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. Right. And as the story moves forward, so in 2017, your father passes away. Yes. And you're, you're in charge. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so, the family's in charge. Yes. So what about, so talk to us about, you know, that transition, like the, 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 the key driver, the key person that, you know, had the vision and let's, you know, move this forward is no longer there. And what's it like to, you know, what was, what was it like when it first stepped up to start running the company? Well, I think that um, obviously it's devastating when you when you lose your parent. Oh, yeah. And um, uh, but we all had been involved in the business. Of course, my mother is alive and is a very strong force in our business. And you know, we had been working on the stadium, the uh, LCA, and um, Dad had unbelievable input. I mean, you know, I think that was his vision. And the sad part, though, is that he died before he actually saw it. So he never was able to walk into LCA and see it done. But he did see parts of it being constructed. And so as a family, you, you move forward and everybody has a role and, you know, and we just we carry on. That's kind of how we were raised. Carry on. In a, but it'll never be the same, in my opinion, without him, you know. Yeah. But. In addition to this, you are involved in so many nonprofits, so many causes. You've got more scholarship funds than anybody I've ever seen. How, how important is that in your business model to make sure that you're giving back? Right. I just, I think that, well, education is really important to me. Um, I believe after everything I've learned that all roads lead back to education. True. I am a regent at the University of Michigan. I am running this year for re-election uh, for my third term because I have such a passion for the work. And I find that if we can help students, the costs of education has become higher and higher. So I feel strongly about scholarships and, and being able to take the resources I have and really impact every student and help them be able to get a good education. We also have a scholarship that my sister came up with a terrific idea. My sister Carol went to graduated from the University of Detroit okay. Law School as well. And so she came up with an idea of doing a scholarship together as siblings. And we would um, sponsor siblings that went to law school at U of D. And cool. we just sponsored our first like sibling group, which was a brother and sister. Yes. Uh, which we think is really cool. So it, it, it impacts students directly. You can help them, you know, pay for costs. And I, I love that. Sure. And Denise, as we're wrapping up the interview, I just got one more question for you. Why don't you tell us your favorite Detroit moment? <laughs> That's so funny. My favorite, there's a lot of them, but my absolute favorite is that picture that you saw with my father. There you go. Winning yes. the Stanley Cup the first time, uh, having the parade, and seeing our city so unbelievably united. It's amazing how sports can unite everybody. Yes. And just seeing everybody downtown, we had red Mustangs, everybody had a red Mustang, we were on a float, and... 
just it was magical winning the Stanley Cup and then celebrating after. Excellent. Yeah. Denise, if somebody's listening to this and they want to connect with you, maybe check out your podcast. Oh, that's so nice of you. Thank you. Which we, we didn't even get a chance to chat about that. But yeah, tell us, what is you know what is your podcast? How can people connect with you? Well, it's uh, very uniquely called, I joke, the Denise Illett Show. <laughs> it's on Apple and Spotify and Amazon, all of the different vehicles with which to listen. And I hope that it's inspirational. I um, care a lot about p- uh, confidence and helping people deal with adversity. I think that, you know, a lot of people are struggling now. Yes. And so I hope that, you know, listening to other guests talk about what they've gone through and how they've coped with it and giving people a few tips on how to do that. I'm hoping that, you know, it'll touch people's hearts and help them through whatever they're going through. So I would encourage everybody to, you know, tune in and check it out. Nice. Denise, it's been it's been great having you on the show today. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and your family story. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And for our audience, you can always roll on over to TotalMichigan.com and click on Denise's interview and get uh, the links to her, the podcast that she just mentioned. We'll talk to you next time when we talk to another Michigander doing some pretty extraordinary things. We'll see you then.